Hi, welcome to the second episode of the Union Chambridge Project's digital broadcast. This video has been made especially for your school in North Northumberland and the Scottish borders. As you know, my name's Becky, and alongside the rest of the Berwick Museum team, we're here to give you all the news and interesting information coming out of the Union Chambridge Project's restoration works. In this episode, we will firstly give you a news update as to what's happening at site. You'll get to see what the bridge looks like right now. Then we'll be interviewing an archaeologist working on the project named Ruth. Some of you have even submitted questions for us to ask Ruth during this interview. If you've done so, well done, because these questions are fantastic. And we'll be able to ask some of them on your behalf later on. Finally, we'll leave you with an interesting challenge about time capsules for you to think about in your classrooms together. Firstly then, let's get a news update as to what's happening at site right now. In the last episode, you might remember that engineers were starting to deconstruct the bridge. Let's see how they're getting on. What do you mean it's not there? A bridge can't just disappear like that. Don't be ridiculous. Oh, we're on. Thank you, Emily Make this in the studio. And here I am at the Union Chain Bridge and behind me you can see, well, absolutely nothing. Where's it gone? Has someone stolen it? Phew, the engineers have taken it away. Oh, that's all right then. You know, I once heard a story about a disappearing bridge. Really traumatic it was. I still can't get over it. Oh, anyway, uh, news update. Engineers have now successfully taken down the entire bridge, so there is currently no bridge here at all. All the pieces of the structure, including the important wrought iron chains, have been removed, dismantled and taken away for inspection. The iron parts of the chain itself are being rigorously tested. Broken parts will be repaired or replaced. Using techniques such as magnetic particle inspection and electron microscopy, Engineers will make sure that the iron is definitely up to scratch before it goes back on. The Swinton Pink sandstone in the pylons is being inspected for erosion and replaced where necessary. The wooden road deck is being totally replaced with brand new wood. The old wood was rotting and not really fit for use for purpose. It's awe inspiring to see this huge gap over the River Tweed where the Union Chain Bridge has stood for over 200 years. We are the first people to see it like this since 1819 and it is hoped that the newly restored bridge should be finished and open again at the end of 2021. So, from the Union Chain Bridge, back to you in the studio, Krishnan Gurumurthy, or is it Sophie Rayworth? Thank you once again for that colourful bridge news update. That was brilliant, wasn't it, to see the big gap where the bridge used to be over the river. But now it's over to a real archaeologist, Ruth Humphreys, who's working on the Union Chain Bridge project. Ruth has recently been training our team of volunteers, who are looking to find out more about the bridge, its workers and border life in 1820 in the archives. As an archaeologist, she looks at different types of evidence to get an idea of what things were like in the past. As well as looking in the archives, she runs archaeological digs to find out what people have left behind in the ground. In her job, she's curious, observant and tenacious to find the right information she needs. Through her work, she's had the opportunity to travel to Egypt and even to Sudan. Let's go over to her now and ask her some of your questions. So thank you so much, Ruth, for doing this interview. Um, in which we ask some questions about archaeology that local school children would like to know the answers to. Um, we have had a massive response from schools, which is brilliant, but it does mean um, that unfortunately we'll not be able to go through all of the questions that were submitted by each child right now. But I have taken a selection. Hopefully it's a good selection and, um, and we'll have a little bit of fun as we go through. Um, so before we crack off with their questions, I just thought maybe would you like to give a little bit of background just as to what you've been doing for the Union Chain Bridge project and what's planned to come next? 
Okay, thank you, Becky. So um, I have previously been um, taking some of the wonderful volunteers who are going to be doing the research and the uh, exhibition about the Union Chain Bridge project I've been taking them through some archive and research skills, both online and in person. Um, or rather when they get to be in person, because it all had to be online because we're all stuck online at the moment. Uh, and next, I believe my the company I work for, Wessex Archaeology, hopefully when the COVID restrictions um, come to an end, should be leading some excavations um, around the site of the Union Chain Bridge, which sounds very exciting. It certainly does. We're definitely looking forward to doing a bit of archaeology around site. And um, actually, that leads us into one of the questions quite neatly asked by one of the school children at Ford First School. Um, we had a student who asked, um, what do you hope to find out about the Union Chain Bridge through the archaeology work? OK, so um, as I understand it from my colleagues who spend their time working in the field team, um, we hope to find out a little bit more about the construction of the bridge itself um, and also a little bit more um, about the industries that would have been uh, affected by the bridge being built. So it would have been a great way of getting materials across the river much more easily than having to rely on a boat. Um, so there's other uh, industries that might have been affected by that, like the coal industry. Um, and um, we also might be looking in the archives to find out a little bit more about the people who built the bridge as well, because um, archaeology um, isn't all just digging holes in the ground. We need to put that in context. And so we also spend our time researching in the library and in the archive offices to find out more about um, the, the lives of the people that might be involved in the things we find in person in the ground. Amazing. That sounds brilliant. Thank you. And if you find things in an archaeological site, you know, after you've been and done your research and everything, um, and you've identified a site and then gone and dug and you found something, we had a student from Prior Park First School who wanted to ask about the, re the recording of all of these finds. Like, how do you keep a, a record of all of your findings? That's a really good question because obviously archaeology is a destructive process so you can only dig things up once and if you get it wrong or you don't make a good record then nobody will ever know what was there so we do keep a record of all of our findings um, we have special sheets that we fill in which um, help us to remember what we need to write down, such as how far down a layer might be or how thick it was or the shape of it, the colour of the soil in that layer, because different soils um, can mean that different things happen there. For example, if you find a really dark grey or white or um, black area then it could mean that that's been burnt and it could be where someone had a fire because it's got charcoal in the soil so it's really important that we write all of this down because a lot of the sites we work on are really big and we'd never be able to hold all that information in our head and it's really important that we write it down in a structured way in the same information over and over again so that we can look at all of it at the end and start to figure out how that site worked and how it was put together and what happened in all the different layers that built up on the site over time. So we're on to um, another question now from another child from um, Holy Trinity First School. Um, they would like to ask, how do you know where to dig for things? That's a really good question because I have to tell you a little bit more information to answer your question. Mm -hmm. There are two main types of archaeology that happen in the UK. Uh, and the first type is where somebody is normally at a university and they teach at the university and they're really, really, really interested in one thing. So let's talk about Romans and let's talk about, I don't know, Roman villas. So they might use 
aerial photography or LIDAR, which is a really cool thing where they fly along the ground and they bounce light off the ground and then they record it. And it tells you if there's any lumps and bumps that you can't see with the naked eye. And that helps you figure out where somebody might have previously, it all comes back to digging holes, dug holes in the <laughs> ground, which have now filled up with soil. Um, and so um, they, they will spend their time trying to think really carefully, where do I want to dig? Now, the second type of archaeologist and the type of archaeology that comes along is what I am. And I basically work in the sector that comes right before people build houses, flats and schools and hospitals and motorways. Um, and we don't necessarily know where to dig. We get told where to mm -hmm. dig and we dig to see what's there. So sometimes we find really exciting things that no one had any idea was there, that no aerial phot photography and no mm. LIDAR and no geophysics um, c would have suggested was there. And the only reason we find it is because if we didn't look, they're going to build a big road through it. Mm. So actually it can be really exciting. Almost find them by accident. Yep, absolutely. It's, it's just luck. Cool. All right, well, I'm going to ask you about exciting and valuable things in a minute. But just before we get to that, we have um, a student in year one at Tweedmouth West First School who'd really like to know about the tools that you use. They ask, what tools do and you I dig with? I wish I should have I should have bought my toolkit. So <laughs> I should probably make a confession that mm -hmm. I don't spend very much time digging anymore because my job is largely to give the people that are going to do the digging all the information about what we think might be there based on the information we already have. So I have got a toolkit because I used to do the digging, mm -hmm. but it's currently a little bit dusty and it's in my spare room in a box somewhere. <laughs> um, but what the primary thing, the main thing we use, and you probably know, is a trowel. And it's a very special type of trowel. It's based on a type of trowel called a pointing trowel, which means it is to a point and a triangle. But there's a little bit that connects the trowel to the point of the trowel to the handle. And that part is called the tang, T-A-N-G, tang. And on an archaeologist's trowel, that's longer to give us more yeah. flexibility about being able to reach. And it makes it more dexterous. Um, dexterous means uh, ability to um, get into more spaces and, and easier to use um, than maybe a pointing trowel your um, parents might go to home base on a weekend and buy to do some plastering or to use in the garden. So it is a specialist tool, although people don't necessarily think it is. We also have different sizes and shapes of those. So if you were excavating a skeleton, we'd use something called a leaf trowel. And a leaf trowel is a much finer point, which is in the shape of almost like a leaf, sort of like a rounded diamond. Uh, and that's much more delicate, it means that you can clean all of the soil away from them much more carefully. Um, I think in the films, people think that archaeologists use lots of brushes. But actually, in the UK, that's totally rubbish, because as I'm sure you all know from the weather recently, it's really wet here. So if you brush things, especially when you're using a skeleton, you're just brushing mud all over them. So if you're lucky enough to work somewhere where it's hot and dry, you might use a brush to help tidy up and clean up your uh, excavation. But we don't really use them very much here. I have used a broom for brushing and clearing a surface where I had an old cobbled surface and I wanted to get the mud off of it. But generally, um, we don't use brushes in the UK or we don't use them very much because they smear, and that's the word we use, they smear everything together. Hmm. So the other tools we use um, are a bit more big and heavy mm -hmm. so we use something called a mattock which um, we use to, to excavate large amounts of soil from a feature and that is like a pickaxe like Snow White and the Seven Dwarves would have but it's got a blunt side as well as a pickaxe side so that you can have either a really direct point or you mm -hmm. can have a much bigger scrape and it is like a scrape and if you're having a really bad day they can be great fun because you can just really go for it um, and the biggest tool that we use is what we jokingly call the big yellow trowel but that's actually a digger so in order to open up our excavations we use a digger 
because it's easier <laughs> and mm. quicker and if we yeah. had to take all the surface off by hand we'd be there for a really long time <laughs> yeah. so um we we're trained and we know when to stop using the digger mm -hmm. but um we do and we call him our big yellow trowel and that's how we open up our excavations um somebody from spittle fair school would love to know how far down do you have to dig in order to find things i think that this young person's maybe thinking Maybe they could have a go in the garden or something. How far down <laughs> oh, do you, you think? Could. Do you think? Because it really depends. So the answer to your question is, when was the last time a person was a person was doing something there that we can find a record of? So sometimes you take the very top layer off and it's right there. You know, um, you can you could just take the topsoil off and you could be right down onto a Roman cobbled surface. Because Ooh. if nobody's put anything, if, if the weather hasn't put anything more on top or people haven't put anything more on top, no one's built anything on top of it, mm -hmm. then there's no reason for anything for there to be a big thick layer. Um, particularly if you are, so the reasons that things get covered up, it's probably the easiest way to explain this, is either nature can dump something on top of something or we can dump something on top of something. Nature normally dumps stuff on top by using water. It, water is the best transporter of mud and sludge mm -hmm. and pebbles and, and sometimes bits of finds from a completely different time period. It's really confusing. We call this alluvium, which is the posh mm. word for river mud basically or water <laughs> deposited mud not even river just water deposited mud and you get what you call alluvial layers and they build up uh, the other way that things get covered up is by people um and um oh i did forget the wind if you're in a really sandy country sometimes the wind also covers things mm. up but again don't get that so much here um mm. but people are the other thing that covers covers up layers and objects so people maybe want to build a house but the land's a bit lumpy so they'll get in a load more soil and they'll make it nice and flat so they can build a house and then those people that house might fall down and then they need to level it off and put a bit more soil on and make it nice and flat so they can build a house and you gradually get there so in that case your early archaeology might be all the way down here but if mm. that hasn't happened and the weather hasn't deposited lots of, of soil and and you know the wind and the rain then it could be just below the what we call the horizon so mm. You never know. And you often don't know until you actually go down and find out. Mm, so this young person could have a little dig. They could have a little dig in their garden. They absolutely could. And um, as long as you've got your parents' permission, <laughs> yeah. then feel free. Because what you might find is that with gardens, often they are leveled off to make them flat. Um, and um, if, if you live in quite an old house, people who've lived in the house before, you might have just thrown stuff out or things mm. might have got dropped and smashed and then maybe a bit more soil got put on the top. So you never know what you're going to find mm. unless you have a, a little look. Um, on to the next question then. We've got um, a question from a young person at the Grove School in Berwick and they would like to ask, what is the most valuable thing that you have ever found and where did you find it? Maybe this person's going to go off and have a look as well. He is it's a treasure hunter, I think. So. Yeah. I'm going to be really awkward and say what is valuable and what does valuable mm. mean to you because there's different ways that we quantify value so the classic way is is it worth a lot of money mm -hmm. but even in England and Scotland what is considered to be a valuable find or as they call it treasure is defined completely differently in England we define it as being gold silver precious stones it has to be you know it's that kind of bling <laughs> yeah but in scotland they define it as being something of national significance so mm. um you can they they also include really old stone tools or mm -hmm. um really beautifully worked um textiles that have somehow survived these things could be considered treasure and um i think that's a really nice way of looking at it yeah. Um, but I think when you asked this question, what you probably asked is what would get the most money if I put it on eBay? Yep. So um, 
that's a tricky question because I'm probably going to have to let you know that in another life I used to work in Africa and when I worked in a country called Sudan which is just underneath Egypt um, I worked on some excavations um, because they were building a really big dam and I worked on some cemeteries there, some burials. And the people that we were excavating were about 4,000 years old and they wow. survived much better out there because it's really dry. So everything mm -hmm. just <laughs> dries out like Egyptian mummies and it just survives for ages. And um, we did find um, gold, mm -hmm. actual real gold necklace pendants. No. And the thing about gold is, mm -hmm. the grown up way of saying it is it's a non-reactive metal. But what that means is if you put a piece of gold in the ground and you leave it for hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of years, it looks exactly the same when it comes out as when it goes in. And you very rarely find gold because gold is so precious that people have dug it up and looked for it for hundreds and hundreds of years. And it's really rare that you find gold. But when you do find it, it looks like it went into the ground yesterday. It's still just as shiny. It, it is. It's yeah. a very magical thing. So. Yes, I have found bling. I found something shiny. But um, if I've got time, I'll tell you about the most exciting thing I find that I thought was the most valuable thing, which is when mm. I worked in Egypt. Mm. Um, I worked in the very south of Egypt and we were excavating and the Egyptians used to love to the eyeliner, they used to paint, it's called coal, and they used mm. to paint it on their eyes. And we think that it was also maybe a bit of sun protection. Mm. Um, and I found a little stone eyeshadow palette in the shape of a hedgehog <gasps> amazing <laughs> it's amazing and I didn't even know they had hedgehogs <laughs> so that that is the that is to me when I think when somebody says what's the best thing you ever found I'm like mm. that little hedgehog that the hedgehog yeah <laughs> Uh, well, thinking of exciting things you could maybe dig up, we have got a few specific questions <laughs> about items that you might have uncovered. Um, I'm thinking about um, a young person at Ford First School who asks, have you ever found any dinosaur fossils, for example, any dinosaur fossils? Oh, now you see, this is a question people ask because archaeologists and paleontologists, people muddle them up. So a paleontologist deals with everything that came before humans or the posh word is hominids, really, although technically archaeologists, we deal with people and the things that people leave behind. Mm. So um, the dinosaurs and people uh, there's quite a long gap between one finishing and modern humans uh, evolving. Mm. So um, I personally would not deal with dinosaurs. That doesn't mean dinosaurs are not very cool. There mm. is a big, a lot of love in my house for dinosaurs, um, but um, I personally don't deal with them. <laughs> uh, not to worry, always worth asking anyway. <laughs> Um, we've done dinosaur fossils. We also had a specific question about meteorites, or space rocks, as I like to call them. Um, a young rocks. person, yeah, space rocks from <laughs> like year <it>. four <laughs> at Tweedmouth West First School was interested in those. Have you ever found anything that's from space, like a meteorite? No, um, I haven't, not knowingly. Um, yeah. There are people, though, and this is a legitimate job, just in case any of you are looking for one, who literally go around the world chasing meteorites. And the final couple of things that quite a few children wanted to know about are ancient coins. If you've had any of those, maybe it's with the gold necklace that you found, mm -hmm. perhaps, or human bones. So I've had lots and lots and lots of human bone. Oh. Um yes i've i've excavated a great number of skeletons in my time um and that's quite common and the reason that's quite common i'm not a crazy person that goes around graveyards um is that um well there's two reasons really firstly there are often um it's, it's all to do with redevelopment so if any of you have ever visited birmingham it's a really good example you'll know that there is a church right in the middle of the ball ring or just next to the ball ring development that mm. just seems to be plonk there like church there you go shopping center 
church mm. and uh, that had a graveyard and when they built the new ball ring um, they had to move all those burials to a new graveyard and they were all excavated by archaeologists so oh. there are actually quite a lot of graveyards around the place that aren't being used anymore or are in city centres and um, it does make a lot of sense to move those burials to somewhere where they're not going to get damaged and those people can be buried away from you know water mains and cars and all of the modern sort of uh, disturbances that would happen. So yes, lots and lots of human bone, both in this country and abroad. The first time you do it is quite spooky. Mm -hmm. I think every archaeologist agrees, um, but it's really, really interesting. Um, and um, there are archaeologists who specialize in that, and they are called osteoarchaeologists, because mm -hmm. osteo is an uh, ancient Greek word, I think, for bone. So Very there we good. go. Um, and ancient coins, yes, uh, Romans were really careless, left them everywhere, ah. loads of them, um, not many gold ones, had a couple mm. of silver, but mostly bronze, uh, or composite, oh. so bronze is a mix of, um, various metals, um, so yes, um, Roman ones mostly, um, or much cool. later ones, but I presume mm. when you said ancient, you meant old, so I, I think the oldest old, ones yeah. I've found are Roman, there are older ones, we did have some in the Iron Age, but I have never found one. So on now to a question from Holy Trinity First School. A young person would like to know what is the most common item that you find in the ground? Okay, so the most common item we find is definitely pottery. Um, pottery, particularly in the Roman period, Romans were really messy and they brought loads of pottery into the country because they were bringing things in from all over the Roman Empire and honestly if you've ever seen the Disney film Wally it would if that was if the Romans had had plastic that would have been our lives we just would have had these mountains of plastic because we find these massive rubbish pits just full of Roman pottery because they were just taking things all over the place and using it to carry all sorts of exciting things um, so pottery is really exciting because it can tell us lots more than just people had pots um, it can tell us about how much money people had it can tell us how people are traveling because we know where different types of it were made um, yeah. it can also tell us sometimes what people were eating and cooking or storing in those pots um, because sometimes there are little tiny bits of that left when it comes out of the ground and we can put them in some very fancy machines that shoot lasers and tell us what was actually in the pot so that's very exciting hmm. Amazing. Right. I'll keep an eye out for them then, because that sounds a bit more manageable than a meteorite. <laughs> um, and on to the final section, then we just had a few people asking about um, you personally and how you became an archaeologist. We had one that just simply says, how did you become an archaeologist from Prior Park First School? Well, I can tell you when I first decided I wanted to be an archaeologist and um, mm -hmm. that was when I had a former archaeologist as a history teacher when I was at my um, we called it an upper school but it would be a secondary school mm -hmm. um, again because I'm old and it was different uh, so um, I was I was about 14 years old when I met Sarah Ansell who had formerly been an archaeologist and had then become a history teacher and she made sure that in our history lessons we did lots of archaeology and we learned about archaeology rather than just history and history books and I was hooked absolutely hooked it seemed like a good idea at the time I was 14 years old and I've not had a better idea since so I'm still <laughs> doing it um, You're sticking with it I'm sticking with it um, and so I then did my GCSEs uh, and my A-levels and I went to university where I studied archaeology and ancient history uh, and then I carried on studying it for a bit longer because I am a sucker for punishment and didn't think I wanted to run away. I'm sure a lot of you would run away from school at the first available opportunity. I stayed there for a really long time. Um, and uh, then I got my first jobs in the field around doing my studies. And yeah, I just carried on. So I decided when I was a teenager and um, I just went and got the appropriate qualifications and and went through so I was really lucky that I ended up having a job that I trained for and that I wanted to do hmm. and the influence of teachers eh when you have a good teacher yeah so. a good teacher is worth their weight in gold that's good well you sort of answered the next question actually that I had there which is um 
do you have to be a certain age to be an archaeologist from St Cuthbert's first school? Have you decided when you were 14 and you were doing some archaeology then? You could be a child and an archaeologist, right? There are some great places that younger people can get involved with archaeology. And one of those is the Young Archaeologists Club, the Yaks. Now, I think you might have to be nine to join. I think that it's nine. It might be somewhere around that age. But I would um, heartily encourage you, if you're interested, get your parents to Google Young Archaeologists Club. It's run by somebody called the Council, well, by a group called the Council for British Archaeology. And they um, also have details on their website about lots of ways that people who don't do archaeology every single day for their job can get involved with archaeology if it's something that they're interested in. Finally, what have we got here from Spittle First School? Another question here. Um, what's the best bit about being an archaeologist? <laughs> Every day is different. So variety. Variety. Yeah, yeah, definitely. And you never stop learning. That is cool. And um, one child here, just a little bit um, sort of curious about the temperature in which you work from St. Cuthbert's First School. She says, um, Ruth, as an archaeologist, is it cold where you work? Well, if they, if they turn the heating off in the office, yes. <laughs> <laughs> but if you, um, but I'm really, I, you know, as I said, these days I spend my time at my desk doing a lot yep. of research to help support the guys that are going to go out and do the actual excavation in the field. So uh, my answer to that question, if I was a field archaeologist, would be sometimes, yes, I have worked in the snow I have worked in all through the middle of winter because it doesn't stop. You work outside mm. all year round. Right. I think we've got time for one last one. And this comes from um, a student in year two at Tweedmouth West First School. They ask, have you ever felt like giving up on a dig? Yeah. But you don't because what you're doing is really important. Um, and you need to be resilient and you learn how to be resilient as well. So I have to say, um, I when I've been, when it's snowing <laughs> or sometimes when you're really tired, um, if you're doing a physical job, you know, people get tired, you get a bit mm. sick sometimes if you've got cold. I think everybody has days when you feel like giving up. Um, but I think it's really important that you, you A, you keep, keep in sight why you're doing things, um, you know, what the end goal is. And that's always to be with archaeology. Normally, in the job that I do is that if you're, or the job that I did in the field, rather, um, is that you're excavating something and you're making a record because that is going to be destroyed. And mm. you need to do a good job because um, if you don't, nobody else is going to do it. Um, um, but also you do get better at learning how to cope with being tired or a bit chilly or a bit too warm. Um, you learn how to eat properly, you keep fit and well and healthy. Um, and um, you also you normally have really great other archaeologists with you. Brilliant. Persevere and you'll get there, eh? Absolutely. Well, I think that is probably, unfortunately, all we've got time for. Ruth, thank you so much for answering these questions from some of our local school children. I hope that they are inspired by the answers. I hope so too. And uh, I hope that, uh, that you all keep learning about history and archaeology because it's really important and it's also really fun. <laughs> Certainly is. How exciting was that to hear from a real archaeologist? I wonder how many students listening to this video will be inspired to become an archaeologist when they're older, just like Ruth. Well, if that's inspired you, we've got a creative challenge for your classroom which you're really going to enjoy. The thought experiment that we've got is for you to consider what items would be really good in a time capsule. A time capsule is a container that holds present day items like photos, newspapers, letters and objects. It's hidden away for someone to open in the future. We're making two real time capsules on the Union Chain Bridge project 
and they're going to be buried after the restoration works are complete. One on either side of the bridge, so one buried in Scotland and one buried in England. What items do you think represent life in 2021? To help you, you might like to research what other people have put in time capsules in the past, or you might like to imagine what you would like to find in a time capsule if you found one from the past. Think about how time can affect materials differently and what sort of items would last well. You can write or draw a response to this thought experiment. What items do you think we should include? Give your work to your teacher and we will consider all of your ideas when we're making time capsules for real at the end of this year. Good luck and we look forward to seeing all your ideas really soon.